Well, let's take our Bibles and look together in 1 Chronicles chapter 13. We're moving ahead now through the history of the Old Testament, just highlighting different stories, narratives that speak to us of the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Again, foretold in types and pictures, prophecy and promise. But as we do comparisons between what we read here in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see the fulfillment in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, we have a very clear and specific story in the life of David where they went wrong and had not consulted the Lord as to how they were to carry the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And the very fatal consequences of not approaching God as he has written in his word. And so I want to speak with you today about God's strict holiness. You should not even perhaps have to put strict in front of holiness because holiness describes it all. We just think we understand God's holiness, but for helping us, many times we have to add something that is more descriptive and that is strict holiness. It's like what we say of grace, the grace of God. Well, grace is God's favor without merit or condition based on man. And yet many times we will say free grace or unconditional grace to make it even plainer for us to understand. So in this lesson, we're going to look at, in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, God's strict holiness. So let's just read a few verses here and work our way down through this chapter, verse 1 down to verse 14. Here we read, And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said unto all the congregation of Israel, If it seem good unto you, and that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel, and with them also to the priests and Levites, which are in their cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves unto us, and let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. And all the congregation said that they would do so. For the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. Now when we read here David's intention of bringing back the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem that had been taken captive by the Philistines, all the way back, as he said there, in the days of Saul. And as he pondered this, there was great agreement that yes, this was the time in which the Ark of the Covenant should be brought back to Jerusalem. And so David consults here with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. Notably, the text does not say that David consulted with the Lord. Here we have David. And again, if David was the Lord's, it's by the Lord's grace and mercy toward him. When the scriptures say he was a man after God's own heart, it wasn't because David himself was perfect. He was anything but. But he was a man after God's heart. In other words, God had set his favor upon David and had purposed that through him his seed should come the Redeemer, God's Son, many years later. But even here we see how David caught up with the zeal 
and perhaps we could say with good intentions to please the Lord and to bring this cart back to Jerusalem, we see already that he consulted men rather than consulting the Lord. You might say in verse 2, well, he brought the Lord's name into it. But it says he said unto all the congregation of Israel. This is why you don't take votes in congregations and see what the congregation thinks. No, what saith the Lord? Any that serve the Lord, their purpose is to take this word and declare it unto the people. The congregation is not a democracy. The church, the true church, is a theocracy. In other words, it has God, theos, reigning and ruling over his church and that through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, here we see their good intentions where it says, if it seem good, verse 2, unto you, and that it be of the Lord our God. Well, that ought to stop everybody right there and bring them to ask, well, what is the will of the Lord our God? How is it that God has given instruction into his word as to how we should approach unto him? It's the same thing we have today with many congregations where they take this Bible and the preacher holds it and opens it and directs people in reading it. But they're coming with their own bias, looking for what they want to get out of it, treating the Bible somewhat like a smorgasbord restaurant where you go through and pick and choose what you like and leave the rest. No, we come to this word asking God to be our teacher and how is it that he declares that we as sinners should approach unto him. But here, even with all of these, again, the congregation with good intentions, making some right statements, yet they took counsel from each other, but not with the Lord. And I'll tell you, that's the danger. Or we look to men, we go to men and ask men what they think we should do in this or that situation, rather than well, what does the word say? What does the Lord say? So may this be already our lesson. But their purpose here was good. They said, let us bring the ark of our God to us, verse 3. That's a very good thing. Now, this was the ark of the covenant, which... God had commanded Moses to make, at this point, more than 400 years before David's time. As we read through these scriptures from the Old Testament and Exodus, Leviticus Numbers, we have to realize how much time literally had gone by. And at this particular point, 400 years. Now this ark here, of which the scriptures speak, was a wood box. In fact, the word ark means box or chest. And so this would have been the ark of the covenant. It would have been completely covered with gold and with an ornate gold lid that was called the mercy seat over which it was put on top of the box, if you will, the ark of the covenant. Now just to help us in perspective, and I'm not going to go back into Exodus and give all the detail as to how this was to be built when Moses built it, but imagine an ark like this already existing for 400 years. It was designed to last because it's a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and the eternality of Christ, even in the wood with which it was made, the shittim wood was a durable wood designed to last, and then the gold, the, the wood representing the humanity of Christ, the gold representing his divinity. But not a very big box when we think of the Ark of the Covenant. It would have been about three feet, nine inches long, 
It would have been about two feet, three inches deep and two feet, three inches wide. So not something that other than being overlaid with gold would really be monumental in the eyes of the world necessarily. But in this Ark of the Covenant, God declared that, first of all, the tablets of the law should be placed. So when we read here, and let us bring again the Ark of our God to us, it is a declaration of the need for this box that represented the presence of God over which the Shekinah glory, when it was in the tabernacle, would rest. But in it were the tablets of the law that Moses had brought down from Sinai. Also, there would have been a vase of manna, a jar of manna, which is interesting because the manna the Lord had ceased giving once Israel entered into the land, and yet here in the ark was preserved this manna from the wilderness. And then thirdly, there was Aaron's rod that miraculously had budded as a confirmation of his authority and leadership as the high priest. Every one of these represented God's authority and God's holiness. When you talk, start with a law, that law had been broken. So it was put into this box. The jar of manna represented how it was that God and his sovereignty had preserved the children of Israel all those years through the wilderness. And then Aaron's rod, representing Aaron's authority as God's high priest, so long as Israel remained as a nation. And this is what this ark represented. So a very serious and important part of the worship that God had ordained. Now the ark of our God, as they call it here, it had come back from the land of the Philistines some 70 years before this. If you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 7, you'll see that this is described, the, the ark being returned to Israel after the Philistines had been stricken by plagues because of the ark and looking into it, all that we see. But in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1, it says here, And the men of Kirjath Jearim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. So here we see where they had already back at this time brought the ark back into the land from the Philistines and yet it still was not in its resting place. In those years it sat at the house of Abinadab but now David and the people wanted to bring it back to the very center where God purposed that his name should dwell and where the temple was to be built and that is to Jerusalem. Now, again, all of this seemed good in the eyes of all the people. The idea of bringing back the ark, the covenant, into its place of prominence with regard to the worship of the Lord. But the question that was never asked is how is it that this ark should be carried? I say the same thing regarding when we meet for worship. It's a good thing for us to meet for worship. And there are some very zealous and dedicated people that make sure that every time the building doors are open, that they're there for worship. And I'm talking about places where they carry in their Bible. And the Bible is read. And there are preachers that tell them to open in the scriptures and follow along. 
And so worship of God is a good thing. He is deserving of worship. But as Christ said to the Samaritan woman, that God seeks those that worship him, how? In spirit and in truth. So by the spirit of God, in other words, it's, a, it's from the heart, but again, and in truth, according to the truth. And this is where we're going to learn that something went wrong. And the day the music died, there's a contemporary song that speaks of that, but here literally there was a stopping suddenly of all of the, the rejoicing in bringing this ark back into Jerusalem because it was not being done in the right way. It was good for both David and for the Israelites to have the ark in Jerusalem. And he knew, David knew specifically, that this represented God's presence. And so again, the desire was right and good, and yet the way in which he went about it was faulty. And I'll tell you, this is where we see the love of God, whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son. I fear more for those in false worship where they continue on and it seems like without any sort of consequence and some might look at that and think, well, look at there. Look how many people are attending there. Look at how big the buildings they have. Look at all of the types of music they play in their times of work. All these things that seem to be a sign of God's blessing and yet if they're not coming through the one way that God has ordained in, by, and through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and by his death alone, and by his grace alone, then all of that is vain. It's vain worship. It's just external activity that people go through the motions. I would rather be one of these that if, as a sheep, and the sheep we wander, yet somehow... <laughs> And again, I always tell people, beware of following the tail of the sheep in front of you instead of having eyes on a shepherd because that sheep will mislead. Even as here, we had all of these people, all of this congregation, many thousands that were gathered together and in agreement and yet were wrong. And so that's what we see here in what follows in verses 5 through 8. Here's the procession now. You can imagine, this is a great day. Everybody in agreement, everybody excited. The ark coming back to Jerusalem. And we find the procession now, the ark from Kirjath Jearim, as I said, where it had been placed there in the house of Abinadab all those years previous. Now, in verse five, so David gathered all Israel together from Sihor of Egypt, even unto the entering of Hamath, to bring the ark of God from Kirjath Jearim. And David went up, and all Israel, to Bala, that is, to Kirjath Jearim, which belonged to Judah. That's why it had been placed there in the first place, because this was a tribe in Judah, to bring up thence the ark of God the Lord. Notice even with what reverence the description is given. Not just here the ark of God, but the ark of God, the Lord. Where you see capital L-O-R-D, that's a reference to Jehovah God. That's a reference to God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The thrice full holy God. And we know that in the New Testament, because the word in the Hebrew is I am. And this is what our Lord Jesus, as he came to earth and dwelt among men, tabernacled among men, and fulfillment of that Old Testament tabernacle temple, he declared himself to be the I am. And told those religious leaders, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sin. So a very significant name. This is the Ark of God, the Lord. And notice that definite article. 
there's only one Lord God. And the word God itself means sovereign magistrate. So we're talking about a God who rules and reigns and determines life and death. He determines who it is that will approach unto him and how it is they will approach. And there's only one way he's ever declared, and that is through the blood sacrifice of his son. But here we see them bringing the ark of God the Lord that dwelleth between the cherubim. The cherubim were made of gold and they sat on that lid that overlaid the, the ark, the box underneath. A representation of the very presence of God and those holy angels that night and day sing holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. And it says whose name is called on it. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab. And Uzzah and Ahio drave the cart. And David and all Israel played before God with all their might. Here's where I say the day the music died. They were playing with all their might and with singing and with harps and with psalteries and with timbrels and with cymbals and with trumpets. So all of this was part of this great procession and there was great excitement in transporting this ark back to Jerusalem. But here's the problem, and it begins with this. There's a couple of issues that are going to come out which show the strict justice or strict holiness of God. We have no idea. We say holy is the Lord. We speak of him as being holy. But I'll tell you, to, to understand the holiness of God, even in a story like this, this is but a small picture of his holiness, that unless we have a righteousness and a holiness that answers to God's holiness, then there's nothing but destruction. I know we have examples. We can go throughout the scriptures and see how God has taken out sinners in his holiness because they have sought to approach him in some other way. And sometimes it could be an individual here and there. Sometimes it could be an entire city. Sometimes an entire nation. But if you want an example of just how holy God is, consider what it was for God to save sinners such as we are. Yes, he chose those sinners from before time. Their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, slain from the foundation of the world. It was necessary that the Lamb be slain since the foundation of the world in order that those that their names are written in that Lamb's Book of Life be justified. And so if you want to see just how holy God is to save a sinner, he can't just overlook their sin. That sin must be answered in every contradiction to God's commands, whether in word, deed, or the spirit, even, of the law. So if you want to see something in God's holiness, look what he did to his son. He spared not his son. Once a year, the blood was to be taken in the tabernacle in the temple and sprinkled on this ark. And that's a type and picture of the blood shed and the necessity of bloodshed for God to be merciful. But all this was foretelling of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, that death that he should accomplish. And so in that we see the just holiness of God, the strict holiness of God. What must our sin be? That it required nothing less than the death of God's Son, God in the flesh, in order to redeem and justify and sanctify his people. And that's what we're seeing here. But here's the first mistake coming back to my text. It sounds good when it says in verse 7, they carried the ark of God in a new cart. They knew enough and had enough respect for this ark to think that we're just not going to put this on any old cart. But even in transporting the ark on a cart was against God's specific command. The ark 
was designed to be carried only on the shoulders of the priests and Levites. And we see that specifically in Exodus chapter 25 in verses 12 through 15. So this is where David went wrong. Now David was a man that knew the law, having been raised and taught it from his youth. And yet in a moment of passion, even with good intentions, the law was set aside. And you can't do that. There's no part of this law that can be set aside. That's why Christ said when he came, he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. In order for him to be that redeemer and savior and justifier, every detail had to be fulfilled and satisfied. And so here in Exodus chapter 25 and verses 12 through 15, we find the instruction that the Lord gave as to how this ark was to be carried all the way back those many hundred years prior in the time of Moses. It says here in verse 14, we'll begin there, Thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. There were stays there, but the purpose was to bear them on the priest's shoulders. Even that's a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, who bore the full weight of God's glory in his person. And the government, it says there in Isaiah, was upon his shoulders. So the staves shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. That's talking there about the law. So here, very specifically, the Lord declared not only that the ark should be carried on the shoulders, but it should only be carried by Levites of the family of Kohath. Each one of those sons of Aaron had their role and were to accomplish it. So that was another thing. Not only was this not put on the shoulders of the high priest, but it uh, was not put on the shoulders of the family of Kohath. In Numbers chapter 4 and verse 15, we see the description and the giving out of the different roles of those that were to serve. You had the sons of Aaron, Koath, and then you had the Gershonites there, and then uh, you have the sons of Merari, those three sons of Aaron. But here in Numbers chapter 4 and verse 15, with regard to the carrying of the ark, this was given to the sons of Koath. It says, when Aaron and his sons had made an end of covering the sanctuary and all the vessels of the sanctuary as the camp is to set forward. So even there, this was all covered over so that people would not look directly on it when it was being transported. After that, the sons of Koath shall come to bear it. But they shall not touch an holy thing lest they die. That's the part here where, again, we see the strict holiness of God. The people that put this on the cart had been touching it as it was. They were perhaps grabbing it by the staves, but they were to continue to carry it on their shoulders. And no, they took that and put it on a new cart, thinking that would suffice. But here is very clear, lest they die. This goes all the way back to the fall. The day that you eat of it, they had the tree of life, but there's that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is the tree of speculation. It begins with knowledge. And men try and determine what's right and what's wrong. And that's what religion is. That tree of knowledge of good and evil from the garden represents what is religion today. People going about to establish their own righteousness. And people might change religions. Go, it's like a bird jumping from one tree limb to another, but it's still the wrong tree. 
because it's the tree of life that represents the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's where Satan deceived Adam and Eve, said that the Lord knows that the day you eat of it, you shall be as God. And therefore, he said, you shall not die. See, that's the lie. It's like people today that think they can just come in any way as long as they're sincere and they won't die. That's the lie of the conscience, it's the lie of the devil, and it's the lie of their own depraved fallen nature. Here the Lord said, they shall not touch an holy thing lest they die. These things are the burden of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation. So all this explains we're about, what we're about to read here. And again, even with the best intentions, how it was that they were approaching and bringing this back to the Lord, even with all the fanfare. See, there's a picture today, people feel like God's present whenever the music's playing and whenever they're singing and people saying hallelujah and amen and all these things. But unless it's Christ alone and his sacrifice alone by which we approach, then uh, it is doing nothing but bringing condemnation upon us. Now, the Philistines, when you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 6 and verses 10 through 11, they had transported the ark on a cart. And so some might think, well, the Philistines did it and got away with it. But they were already condemned. And uh, so what pertained to the Lord's people and as to how this ark should be carried was according to the law. These Philistines were already condemned and so being left to themselves, they did as they would. But we're not to take our example from those around us. See, that's where, where people go wrong. They think, well, that congregation is doing this, this congregation is doing this, so why can't we? No. We're to take our example, we're to take our instruction from the Word and not from men and their innovations. And so we see here, as I read before in verses 7 and 8, that uh, all of this fanfare was going on. And it looked good to their eyes for a time. But now let's read on in verse 9. When they came under the threshing floor of Kidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, and the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him, here it is, we just read about it in Numbers chapter 4, because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before the Lord. This is not God just reacting. I think there's some that think that God is just arbitrary as he rules from heaven and decides at this point he gets angry. Now I'm going to zap that one and, and then, no, I'm going to zap this one. Or I'm going to let this one go. No. God is a sovereign judge and ruler. He acts always according to his word and according to his attributes. And in the key attribute of God is not love. Love does not explain God's wrath. Love does not explain God's justice. But when you have, as I've often said, the hub of the wheel being God's holiness, and you have to understand in all the book of Acts, the word love is not mentioned one time as the apostles preached the gospel. They preached his holiness and his justice and the necessity of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ to satisfy a holy God. And when you have holiness as that main attribute, it explains everything else. It explains his wrath. It explains his justice. But it also explains his grace and his mercy. That if he's going to be gracious and merciful, it's going to be in accord with his holiness. That's what this Ark of the Covenant represented. God's presence, God's holiness and the mercy seat, but not mercy at any price or in any way, but according to his God had declared that that mercy 
should be shown. So it should not surprise us here when Uzzah and Ahio drove the new cart. The meaning of the names of these sons of Abinadab paint a meaningful, meaningful picture. Uzzah literally means strength and Ohio means friendly. So as far as persons and even in their role in which they led this cart, a very honorary role that David appointed unto them, and yet it was not according to how God had instructed. Even with David and all Israel playing music before God, Judging from the importance of the instruments mentioned here, when it says with singing in verse 8, and harps, and psalteries, and timbrels, cymbals, trumpets, that's quite an orchestra. It created a very joyful, exciting, and engaging atmosphere. And that's what people tend to like. We're often tempted to judge a worship experience by how it makes us feel. When people ask me, well, how was worship today? I never know exactly what they want to hear. We're not going to talk about the music or wow, today it just seemed like there was really a great emotional experience. No, none of that is significant when it comes to worship. How was worship today? Well, Christ was exalted and we sat and listened to his word read we sang his word back to him, and we heard the word preached that exalted his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And whether there's an amen or not, and the emphasis being on instruments, it's not. It's on what we sing that is vital. And we realize that worship has to do with honoring God, then it must be in the way that he has declared. And so, here in verses 9 and 11, Uzzah touches the ark and immediately is killed. This is why we need all this context to understand. This is not just God reacting and getting upset. When they came to Kidon's threshing floor, you think about a fleshing, threshing floor there in verse 9, where they have the stalks of wheat that had been gathered and the staff separated from the wheat. This is where all this was done. So there would have been a lot of staff or chaff in this production when the Lord would cause the chaff to blow away. So when the ox cart got to this point, all of a sudden the way got rough. Well, with all of this stock and debris there. And so Uzzah puts out his hand to hold the ark. And even as the Lord said there, they shall not touch an holy thing lest they die. It's like Adam and Eve. As soon as they partook of that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, immediately, you say, well, they didn't die physically. They did spiritually. They became aware of their nakedness and guiltiness before a holy God. But here was in the lesson, you can imagine, as soon as Uzzah reaches out to touch this ark and stabilize it, you think, well, it was a good intention. Yes, but Numbers 4.15 declares that they should not touch the holy thing lest they die. And there we see God acting in judgment according to his word. How is it that he judges sinners? We have people today that say, well, I just can't believe God would actually send sinners to hell. Well, you don't know God. In that, you don't understand your own sinfulness and you don't understand the strict holiness of God. It is of no consequence for God to cast sinners into hell who have no answer to his absolute holiness and righteousness or even worse, have sought to approach him in their way with their good intentions. As someone said, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. No, God's holy and just. That's why we need the Lord Jesus Christ. And we dare not presume to reach out. Like they say, reach out and touch God. No, unless it is through the mediator and the way that God himself has declared, then there's nothing but condemnation 
that awaits. And so here was David wanting Israel to know the presence of the Lord and doing it in this way by popular vote, if you will, and yet it was the wrong way. And I'll tell you, God showed up. <laughs> he manifests his presence there at Kidon's threshing floor. But it wasn't in the way that anyone wanted. See, this is the thing about people today in their worship of God. They think by their multiplying their words and their prayers and, and their zeal and efforts that somehow God is, is, is blessing them when things go well. But what happens when he does manifest his justice and holiness and sovereignty in acting in, in a way that men think to be severe? But either way, God is manifesting his presence. God struck Uzzah because it was not in the way that God said that he should approach. You know, he erred right along with everybody else in the matter of how the ark was to be transported. Small detail, you say. Well, yeah, it was everything. And he erred in thinking that it didn't matter. Not only who transported the ark, because it was very specific, it was to be of the house of, of uh, the Koas, but, not, but also erred in how the ark was transported. And so, in every way, error in thinking is devastating. I pray the Lord keep our mind. That's why we need the word. We need a word from the Lord, because our minds are depraved. And if we come according to our feelings or emotions and not according to this word, then we most certainly will stand condemned. Here we see a lesson that it would have been better for that ark to fall on the ground, on, in the dirt. Talk about just how depraved man is than for a human hand to reach out and touch that ark without a sacrifice. And you can see David's reaction because as it says there in verse 10, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and he smote him because he put his hand to the ark. And there, notice, he died before God. When it says he died before God, it's not in the sense of entering into God's presence then with blessing. No, he died a condemned sinner before God, the holy judge, and that was his just due. We can't complain when we hear of God executing his judgment upon sinners. We're shocked. We see somebody today and the next day they're gone. But we live in a society in a generation where everybody's trying to preach everybody into heaven thinking that somehow if they leave here they're immediately ushered into God's presence. That's not so. There are millions upon millions, a number which cannot be numbered, that perish, are perishing, and suffering under God's eternal wrath because they have not approached unto God in the way that he has declared and they've come in their own way and that can only be certain condemnation. We see David's anger here in verses 11 through 14. David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah Wherefore, that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? You see his first reaction, displeasure, anger. See, that's what this flesh does. It never takes the blame. Initially, it'll find fault with God. But again, being an object of God's grace now, God mercifully by his spirit begins to show David that the fault is with him. It's like he did in his sin with Bathsheba. The Lord sent Nathan and said to him, Thou art the man. That's where we see God's grace and mercy toward David, where even in his sin, the Lord brought him to bow. Why? Because he was one of those for whom Christ should pay the debt when Christ would come into the world. And 
we can see the change from verse 11. David was displeased, angry, and yet, verse 12, now what? Afraid of God that day. Oh, thank God for the fear of God. That's the beginning of wisdom. To know God and His holiness and justice and to fear ever coming in any other way. And that's the question. How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? How is it that I'm going to enjoy the presence of God? That's a question we all need to ask. Is it just in any way? That's why we just don't go anywhere to sit down and worship just because they have music and lots of people and a big building. All that. No. Better to be alone with the Lord and laid low at Christ's feet to worship him in truth and ask this question, how? When it says, how shall I bring the ark of God home to me? How may I, as a wretched sinner before God, enjoy God's presence and satisfaction through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ? It says, so David brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months. All this time now is time for reflection and seeking the Lord, which was not done in the beginning. But I'll tell you, it's just like Jonah fleeing. He ended up in Nineveh exactly at the time that God purposed. And the same here. This ark would be returned to Jerusalem exactly, even with this delay, exactly at the time that God had purpose. But the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. I don't know how that blessing was manifest, but it was evident that with that ark in his house, the Lord was blessing. Now, the house of Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom was a Levite of the clan of Kohath. So automatically, even from the beginning, David understood his error. It was not to be just any priest, Uzzah and Ahio. No. Here it was the family or the clan of, of the Kohathites. We see that in 1 Chronicles chapter 26, if you look a little bit forward there with me. 1 Chronicles chapter 26 and verse 4. Moreover, the sons of Obed-Edom were Shemaiah, the firstborn, Jehozabad, the second, Joah, the third, and Sakar the fourth, and Nathaniel, the fifth. Who were these? We'll look up in verse 1, 1 Chronicles 26, concerning the divisions of the porters. In other words, those that were to carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Korhites, and it goes on down through there, then Obed-Edom would have been one of those. That, that explains, doesn't it, why it was that the Lord directed David to place the ark there and to start over when it was the Lord's purpose to do so. And so we see how the Lord then blessed Obed-Edom and uh, his family during that time that the ark was there. We'll stop there for now and pick up with the rest of the story the next time of how they did ultimately bring this ark into Jerusalem. But the strict holiness of God, oh, that God may cause us to see that apart from Christ, our high priest, having borne and carried all that pertained to God's law and justice on his shoulders, as the sin bearer of his people, there's no hope, no salvation. But in him is all of salvation. Amen.